welcome to the 250 subscriber special of Ratting Road. In this video, I'm pretty much doing what I said in the small announcement and just giving back to you guys in a way I thought would have been quite nice. I've just provide a bit more of a backstory on the layout and also answer the questions you asked me. I've received quite a few, quite a lot of them to be fair, so I'll answer them as best as I can and I hope I surpass your expectations or at least reach them. It was great meeting a lot of you at Worley, um, Richard at New Junction, Tim at the, the Scrap Line and also John at Piccadilly, just to name a few. It was great to meet all of you equally. Um, I hope to see more of you again in the future at future exhibitions. And also to channels I hadn't subscribed previously, like James at Tony Dock Station. It was great having a chat with you also. And again, I hope to see you in the future at exhibitions. But I'm going to get straight into this and I hope you enjoy the video. One of the most common questions I had was what got me into model railways or what made, what made me a train enthusiast. When I was younger, I used to spend quite a bit of time on the railway with family. Uh, my dad was a rail enthusiast back in the day and my uncle still is today. I also spent a lot of time on the railways traveling with my auntie. Um, one of those memories was seeing uh, going to Ipswich one day and I remember the Ipswich railway tunnel was closed so all of the services were terminating either at Manning Tree or at Ipswich. One of the biggest memories I've got then is seeing um, 86 227 I believe it was um, Golden Jubilee in the Ipswich um, loco sidings and that had the big Union Jack along with the nameplate along the side of it and I've always remembered ever since going there and I must have been about six seven years old at that point. I also remember the day um, a driver also showed me the inside of a class 321 um, electrical multiple unit which was also a nice fond memory and also we used to, I used to spend a lot of time with my dad when he was an enthusiast and we used to go to uh, places like Heritage Railways. A particular favourite of ours was the North Norfolk Railway, in, obviously in Norfolk. Uh, that, ran, that runs between Holt and Sheringham. And we used to spend a lot of time on the um, on the Kenning Heath campsite. We always used to catch the train down to Sheringham, have fish and chips, all that sort of stuff. I've just got loads of memories. I could talk all day, but you get the idea. Another question was, what are my top three favorite layouts of all time? Um, number one would have to be Warren Lane, which Unfortunately, I don't think exists anymore, but um, those who knew that layout would probably understand why it's my favorite. Um, it was a double O gauge freight liner container terminal with working Helgen cranes, and it was just amazing to watch. Unfortunately, I never got to see it in the flesh because by the time I was involved in railway modeling, it had already come off the exhibition circuit and had been sold on to another owner. So. If I ever get to meet the original owners, it'll be a dream come true, quite frankly. So obviously I love that layout simply because of basically what, it's, what it is, what it's surrounded by. And it also it's, uh, it's got overheads on it. And obviously I'm a big fan of overhead electric railways. And um, it was also based in East Anglia as well on the Great Eastern Main Line like this. So that's also another thing that I liked about it. My second favourite layout of all time would probably have to be Minsterly. Um, I'm not sure if I've pronounced that correctly, but that is a YouTube layout and I just love it for its overheads and I'd, I'd just love to be able to build overheads to that standard. Um, they're just out of this world. If, you, if you've never come across that channel, I highly suggest you do. It's, it's just insane, in my opinion, to put it in one word. I just, like, I just love that layout for the level of detail and again, the overheads and I just really enjoy watching all his running sessions really more than anything. Uh, my third favourite layout, I couldn't actually decide between these two which one I liked more, so it's just going to have to be two layouts for sec uh, third place. Um, one of those layouts is Alderford. I came across that layout fairly recently actually, 
And then again, it was a layout with overheads on it. And again, I just loved watching it run and love the atmosphere, the overheads create. And again, big fan of the electrics on it. And the other layout is Koppel or Kapel. I don't know, again, not sure how to pronounce it, but pretty much love that for the same reasons as well. And they are fairly similar layouts in terms of sort of operation. But if I had to choose between the two, I simply wouldn't. So um, again, big props to those two layouts. And I'd love, I've never seen them in the flesh before, but I'd love to eventually. Another question that was asked was what gave me inspiration to build the layout. Again, it was a mix of things like my dad being a modeler, so it was sort of following in his footsteps, along with seeing layouts on YouTube. Like uh, That's how I came across um, Warren Lane, and because I love that layout so much, that's uh, another big inspiration to it as well. Also, hence the uh, container trafficking you see on it. And again, just I just had the opportunity to do it. Um, eventually on my own and I felt the confidence and well I felt confident enough to do it so I thought well it can't help trying. So Ratting Road construction began in December of 2017. I'd moved house um, a few months previous to that and had a perfect sized shed in the back garden which quickly got allocated as a railway room. So I had the baseboards built for me by a family friend which were then constructed and put into place and then it was just a matter of getting straight forward with the track. When I first started building Ratting Road, the intention was to do a double O gauge container terminal, um, obviously inspired by uh, Warren Lane. The container terminal I chose to, I wanted to base it on was the Freightliner terminal at Bristol. Um, I found that was a quite a nice simple track plan to do. You just had a two track running main line with a third line as your entry and exit to the terminal. And then that just had three lanes and then rather than having um, cranes, they all use the container stackers. So I thought if I got hold of some die cast stackers, it would look really good. But unfortunately, um, that never made it to light. I had all the track laid down, but I was just disappointed with how it turned out. I did not like using the um, set track curves on the uh, in the container terminal. I just think it spoiled the whole thing. So in the end, I did take it all up. I also had more going on in the field yard as well to obviously incorporate those um, long, those rakes of wagons and just for extra loco storage. But again, due to space, I just thought that the field yard just wasn't big enough or it just, it just didn't really, I just wasn't really impressed with it whatsoever. So I ended up scrapping that as well. At the time, I was going through quite a difficult time in for my personal life as well. So all of these factors adding up, it just took my enthusiasm away from the hobby like completely. And I didn't come in the shed for about four months. So I pretty much just had a, a shed with just a load of baseball in it and no track for a matter of months. It wasn't until about April 2018 where I finally got the mojo back and just decided just to put my head down and just think of what I can do and what would I think would look good in the space that I had. So eventually, after a long time persevering, sort of brainstorming ideas and trial and error, I finally came up with a layout that I was happy with in terms of operation, um, size and just how well it flowed and it fitted quite nicely into the space I had. So I was really happy with that. I really felt the get go with this layout. So I wasted no time and got straight into learning about uh, ballasting and just all how to do all the scenery and all the rest of it. I watched a hell of a lot of Everard Junction videos as um, a lot of other people do. And I um, just watched loads of tutorials on various things and I sort of practiced and also self-taught a few things myself. And eventually just built up my confidence and then away I went really. So I had the track ballasted, all of the trackside detail beforehand. Just didn't really stop from there.
and eventually I was ready to start the building the embankment, which is obviously still not finished today. So watch, again, watched videos and tutorials on how to build up the scenery, sort of just followed their stay, uh, steps and again sort of taught myself a little bit too. And um, obviously these are the results of when I first done some scenery. And this was when I first started building the disused line area where the railway line used to go. So this is when I first done the gravel path and all the scenery around it, along with the um, path towards the railway crossing. And then before adding all of the signs and fencing beside it. Then it was time to add the overhead live masts and wires. This leads me on to another frequently asked question and that is what overhead masts and wires do you use? Um, the masts on the layout are Pico masts that I've modified to look more prototypical. I wasn't quite happy with how they appeared and I also was also a bit concerned about how high the wires would be on my layout considering the track is raised and the masts will be flat on the board. Once I was happy with the mast position, I added the wires in, which are the Pico wires. You can get these in packs of five from pretty much anywhere, and they all come in different uh, five different lengths, which makes them quite handy. And then I also made up a little mast to put behind the tunnel, what you can see here. That was just done out of scrap rail and some pieces of rod, so just so the wire can attach to it. Then it was a matter of painting the wires black so they didn't stand out from the scenery. And obviously, like real life, you only see them when you're pretty close up to the railways. Then when my class 90s arrived, I just eagerly tested them and that went really well. And I was, it was really nice to finally get some AC electric locos running around the layout. So that's pretty much all of the history covered. I won't show much more of the layout because then it sort of depend. It does take away the whole point of future videos. Um, I've certainly covered the most interest, more interesting parts of history. So to finish off, I'm just going to answer the remaining questions. So Richard over at St Michael's Hill asked me what signals I use and how I power them. Uh, all my signals are from Burco. I quite like them because they're reason uh, pretty reasonably priced and I think they look quite nice when they're illuminated. All my signals are also powered by circuit, these circuit boards with built-in infrared um, sensors. So when a train passes over them, they automatically turn to red. So if I just plot my hand above the sensor for this signal there, you'll see it turn to red. So that's what will happen when a train passes over it, just like real life. And this is just a little module that powers the signal above it. So it's wired up to the bus wires and then the wit signal is wired to that. This module in particular has a built-in timer on it. So over a set amount of time, the signal will basically work its way back through the aspects and back to green. So the signal's currently red and then in any second now it will turn back to orange and then eventually it will go back to green so it's just got a set timer on it so it just acts as though when the rear wagon of a train or coach of a train has passed the next signal on it will then turn to orange like so and then eventually it will go back to green so that's basically how these signals work. So this signal here, again by Burko, if I can just get it into focus, that'll, that'll just about do. 
So that is pretty much by Berker as well. And then this one's powered by the same sort of module. The only difference with this one is that it hasn't got a built-in timer on it. So once it changes to red, it will pretty much stay red till it's cleared the signal down the line. So this one pretty much works as a real signal would work. And then the signal after this is on, it's got the same module as the other signal with the timer. So then that, will, that signal will cycle through the aspects and then this signal will correspond to it. So this one will just go to red and just stay like it until the rear wagon of a train or rear coach has cleared the, um, the next signal. And then this will just cycle back through the aspects. Cambridge East Model Railway, another YouTube channel, asked me if I plan on ever getting any EMUs for my layout or electric multiple units. The simple answer to that is yes, I do 100% because as this layout was based or is based on the Great Eastern Main Line, um, typical units you see on that are uh, Class 321s and 360s. Well, they, they've still got a little bit of time left on there before all of the um, sort of the foreign I can't remember their names now, like the 745s I think they are, and 720s as well, before um, once they're sort of in service, then the 321s will sadly go. Um, also 379s on the West Anglia main line for the Cambridge and Stansted Airport services, so I'd like to have some of them, but um, I'm not really much of a fan of what's on offer at the moment. Um, there isn't really any offerings for EMUs at the minute, and. The only ones I can think of really that are sort of appealing but not at the same time not appealing are um, the Batman 450 and um, sort of that sort of type of VMU to the Zeros. Um, not really much of a fan of those to be honest but yeah I easily do want to get some electric multiple units in the, f in the future and I just hope that Batman or another high quality manufacturer eventually um, do make some. A bit of a difficult one this one. I'd say what I enjoyed the least was probably the track laying because like I explained earlier in the video um, it took quite a while to me to get to a stage where I was happy with what the layout was but at the same time another task was also pretty much what everyone else says like the point motors and the electrics um, especially the point point motors because I'd never done them before but I, did, I didn't find them that much of a challenge to be quite honest. And what I enjoyed the most was probably doing all the scenery. So like what you can see on the right down there. Um, there are The only thing I don't like about the scenery though is the trees. So I will eventually take those out and redo some of them, maybe with sea foam. So that's uh, something I've got planned to do in the future in a video. So another, the last question I'll answer what loco is my favourite in my fleet so far. Um, I'd have to go with my two-tone grey class 90. Uh, that has a Lego Man Biffo sound chip in it. And um, at the moment it's not actually at home, it's not actually with me right now. Uh, that's away from home along with my Freightliner Powerhall class 90 and um, another 66 as well. They're being worked on by the guys who do all my weathering for me, so I'll hopefully have those back within a few months. Um, by the time I have that back, the um, two-tone grey 90 will be in Freightliner grey. So it will still have the two-tone grey. It will just have the Freightliner um, branding rather than the rail freight distribution. It will also have um, faded depot plaques and it will become 90047. So that will certainly, I feel like that will certainly be my favourite loco in the fleet. there we go guys pretty much answered all the interesting questions I didn't answer all of them because the video would have just gone on for a long time and I didn't want to bore everyone to tears so I pretty much answered all of the most interesting questions if you want to put it that way 
So I just want to say a big thank you for getting involved, but also for being a subscriber to my channel, watching my videos and just getting involved. Um, it's nice to know I do generate some interest in the model railway community. And again, thank you to um, those who I met at Warley. It was a pleasure. And I hope to meet some more of you in the future as well at future exhibitions. So just to finish the video off is a little insight into what's to come in the next month or so um, before I get the next layout update in. So you can see the signal box down there in its spot. So obviously part two of that's coming. I've already started filming part two and I've also started applying a couple of the details. Uh, points to you if you can spot those. I did have it in view when I was standing up there filming a clip earlier on. So um, I did try to not give anything away, but again, so yeah, that's coming in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. And then if I just come over here, you can see um, a couple of bits I got from Morley or a couple of stocks. So I've got some Network Rail Mark IIs over there. Um, I did go for those, but what took me by surprise was this one, the, another Class 90. I've got a review of this model coming because it's the Backman Collectors Club exclusive. So it's 90128 um, Vracht Verbinding uh, BRSNCB or Belgian livery. livery. Uh, this model has also come sound fitted, so I'll also get some footage of the sounds in there. So I've got a review of this coming. It is a lovely model, but I'll talk more about that in the video itself to come. And then just turning over to the um, workbench, you can see on top of the box is one of my Hornby KFA wagons. And I'm just in the process of fitting a, um, a flashing tail light to that. And then the whole idea is that a container will go above all of the electronics and components that work it. So I thought that would be a nice touch to add. And then to the left of those, you've got a couple of Virgin Mark 3s. Those will be coming TSOB coaches ready to be resprayed into Greater Anglia livery. The latter I probably won't be recording because, again, it's sort of a first time project and another thing as well. I probably won't get that done till at least a few a couple of months, but I've just put there for the video really more than anything. The the wagon itself, the container wagon, I'm picking something up next week, so I sh that should be working by next this time next week. So if anyone wants to see a video of, on how to add those flashing tail lamp kits, then uh, let me know and I'll get one out. Um, they do make a nice touch to any model railway because obviously all wagons in real life have a flashing tail lamp at the back, so just makes it a bit more like real life. So there we go guys, just some plans of what's to come. So again, thanks for watching this video. I'm just going to end it here now. Take care, happy modeling, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.